Our sermon is Say a Prayer. The scripture is Mark 11, 20, and I did extend it through verse 25. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. When you stand praying, forgive. If you have nothing against anyone so that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for today. We thank you for all that has been done, all that you are doing, and all that we know you will do. We stand in faith believing that you are God and that you are able. Right now, God, all I have in front of me are just some words. Magnify them, God. Allow them to edify your people. Hide me behind the cross so that they see none of me and hear none of me but all of you. It is in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the first part of this story was in the first reading. Jesus was hungry and he was walking down the road and he saw a fig tree, tree that had many leaves on it and approached it to see if there were figs on it. There weren't. And so he said, nobody will eat from you ever again. Now, scripture also tells us that it wasn't the time for figs. So, you know, I, I think about this and in, in just for the record, don't get hangry. Okay, as, as Christians, we should not be hangry. I just, and, and I also think it's also a testament to Jesus' patience with us. Because if he could curse a fig tree, I'm just saying. Okay, so we just, we just need to just, that's just my footnote for this sermon. <laughs> as they're heading back, Peter goes back and says, uh, Lord, you remember that fig tree? It has withered to the roots. And the first thing Jesus says in response is to have faith in God. If you do, you can tell a mountain to be thrown to the sea. Now that seems like a lot, but it isn't. Now, this week I was reading each year the uh, American Psychological uh, Commission, Association commissions a study on stress in America. Of course, for 2021, you know it, it, it was off the charts. Stress in and of itself can affect our health, our physical health, our mental health, just our entire being. It affects the way we sleep, and in some cases, it even may paralyze us when it comes to making decisions. Sometimes, it keeps us from being able to deal with even the simplest of tasks. Now, although situations themselves cause stress, additional stress can be caused by our inability to react in a way that is positive to those situations. Now, even though scripture tells us not to worry about anything but to pray about everything, we tend to stress about some situations, and that stress can lead to worry. So how do we know we're worrying? Here are a couple of questions. Are you consistently trying to find solutions before it's time for one? Are you asking what's next? Are you creating scenarios about what you will say or what you will do the next time X happens? good people, you are worrying. Are you praying the, Lord, 
I know you will do it. Lord, will you do it? Lord, I want you to do it. You know that series of prayers, not necessarily all in the same one, but, you know, over and over again about the same situation. Then you're not working in faith. And that worry about that situation has lowered your level of faith. Now, I'm not going to get into the, well, I'm concerned, because, you know, people say I'm concerned and I'm not worried. I'm just concerned because there may be a healthy way to be concerned. But let me tell you something. If you've been concerned for a period of time, you're worried. That's what it is. That worry lowers your level of faith. Now, once we get to the solution, we're good for the I knew God would do it. Or as my mother used to always say, while I was trying to figure it out, the Lord has already worked it out. And we thank God and we praise him and we talk about how we are not going to do it the next time. But what happens? The next time, we find ourselves doing the same thing all over again. Well, maybe not we. Maybe it's just me. I'm we. The first thing that Jesus tells his disciple is to have faith in God. And although we may not think so, our practice shows that we may, not, we may take for granted the connections between faith and prayer. Often our prayers are, expression of wor- are expressions of worry instead of faith. This is why we end up repeating them or adjusting them just to, you know, that whole series. While we may not think about it that way, our practice shows that we tend to forget that our prayer should be an expression of the faith that we have, that God can and God will do it. That God can and God will do what God says. Lowered levels of faith create the worry that accompanies our prayers and faith and worry are in opposition to each other. James 1 and 6 tells us, but ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. If you have ever stood at the edge of water, personally or virtually through the Weather Channel, because you know they show us all kinds of water and all kinds of things, you see how rough the water is by looking at the white caps on the waves. And if you've ever been a boat in the wind, you know that the stronger the wind, the more difficult the boat is to steer. James was trying to get us to understand that doubt is like that. If we doubt, we pray ineffectively because we shift according to what is going on outside of us instead of standing on our connection to God through the Holy Spirit. Doubt and worry are our biggest impediments to true faith. So we need to take this seriously. Our relationship with God depends on how seriously we take this. Ask in faith, never doubting, not worrying. Doubt can inhibit our ability to ask with the boldness necessary, and it reveals that our lack of faith is much like the way the wind blows the waves. The sooner we make the conscious decision to stand on our connection to God and stop picking and choosing our level of faith, whether we're doing that intentionally or unintentionally, we have to remember that we stand on that connection. And that connection should supersede any doubt or any worry. The sooner we do it, the sooner we can have a kingdom mindset. The sooner we accept the level of God's love for us. It is never limited. It is always abounding. Our faith connects us to God's love. Our faith 
allows us to pray. Knowing that we can pray for whatever we need because God loves us. Philippians 4 and 6 says, Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, I once heard a preacher say, That's begging. Beg God. That's not what it's about. It's about being honest and clear and understanding that God is not going to get mad at us for our prayers. Now, I was raised in a household where, now my mother didn't say this, but, but one of my aunts did. You can never get mad at God. If you've ever had anything or dealt with someone who's had a serious tragedy, they feel that anger. It's okay. Because we can pretend that God doesn't know us, but we can't stand in faith and say, God knows our every, our every heartbeat. Every hair on our head is counted. And then get to a situation and say, well, I'm angry and God can't see that. Allow for our faith to stand for the truth of how we feel. Allow your faith to stand for the truth in how you feel. We can pray with a level of faith that I think is probably beyond our ability to understand. We can pray and become true children of God bringing the faith of the kingdom to this world and to our world. We can pray for mountains to be moved and removed without concern about how, but rather with the knowledge that by faith it will happen. Our prayers are our way of building our relationship with God. Hebrews 11 and 6 tells us that anyone who wants to come to God must believe that God is. Our prayers cement the belief that God is and that we believe that God will hear and answer. You don't have a conversation with somebody you don't believe is there. And prayer should be conversations, a dialogue with God. You talk and you listen. Our prayers should be built on a foundation of praise, thanksgiving, and faith. And opening a dialogue with God allows God to be able to give instruction, correction, and encouragement. We have to know the difference between timidly asking God and praying a prayer in faith. Knowing in our hearts that God knows the difference between the two, with us individually. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times when we all go to God feeling some kind of way. There are all all time, always times when we just feel some kind of way. It's just honest. And as I said, since God knows our hearts and minds, God hears what we say, even when we are not feeling our best. So don't think you have to wait until you're feeling better to pray. Don't think that it has to be set up in this great format. Sometimes in the deepest part of our hearts, we can say, Lord, have mercy, and that's a prayer. All I'm saying is, perhaps we need to begin some reconnaissance on our prayers. Now, reconnaissance is a military observation observation of a region to locate an enemy or to ascertain strategic features. So yes, we need to observe the region of our hearts and minds to locate our enemy, which is a lack of faith in that doubt and worry, and ascertain the strategic landscape of our prayers so that we can go boldly to the throne, praying in faith, knowing that God has moved mountains in our lives in the past, some we never even saw 
and that God can do it again. So I tell you, and this is what Jesus says, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your God in heaven may also forgive you. Yeah, it matters. It matters. Jesus reminds us that we should not only have faith, but that there is a, also a direct relationship between our forgiving others and God's forgiveness of us. Now, a direct relationship means that there, as one variable increases, so does the second, and as the second variable decreases, so does the first. So the more faith and forgiveness that we have, it increases our, the reality of our prayer. Think about that. We forgive and God forgives us. We want our prayers to reach a landscape that is open, free, and truthful to God. The more our faith increases, the more the reality of our prayer increases. The more we forgive, God has nothing to hold on us because we are doing as Christians, what we should be doing. Clarity is key. We must realize that it is not always something we can understand. However, even if we cannot grasp the necessity of us believing in faith in how much God can do, even if we cannot grasp the enormity of what our faith in God can accomplish, we can and must still pray. Even if it is beyond your level of current understanding, our level of current understanding, we can still pray. All I can say is, maybe there aren't enough words to describe the amount of faith that, God, that Jesus is talking about. However, you'll know it when you get there. Your prayers will be free, they will be truthful, and they will not hold anything back. Lack of forgiveness, doubt, worry, stress, when it occupies our hearts, it keeps us from the unhindered faith that will move mountains. When you pray, pray in faith. Don't be afraid to pray what you feel. Those prayers will be heard. Close your eyes and listen and feel the peace of God surround you and all you are praying for. Because sometimes, if the mountain isn't moved, God will show you a way around it, up and down it, or straight through it. Amen.
Thank you.